This is a video about instinctive shooting. The purpose of the video is to tell you why you'd shoot a bow instinctively, how to do it, and then how to perfect your instinctive shooting skills. Come on along with us and let's take a real in-depth look at the secret and all the myths that go with and the information on instinctive shooting. Pretend that my hand is holding a bow and my thumb is a sight pin. I've got the bow vertical. Let us say that I have to cant the bow over on its side and watch what happens to the sight pin, my thumb. It's no longer over the kill zone. The arrow will shoot to the right and low. The point of that demonstration I just showed you is very important for someone who considers himself a real hardcore bow hunter. In most true hunting situations, especially those where the hunter is on the ground rather than in a tree stand, you're very seldom given the option of having a bow perfectly vertical. The only way sight pins work on a bow is if the bow is held vertical. Tilt the bow, the sight pin moves down and to the right your arrow will go very wide of its mark, possibly causing a wounded animal. I've talked to many, many bow hunters around the country who've explained to me how they had this opportunity, but it didn't work out. They had that opportunity, but it didn't work out. Uh, I couldn't shoot because I was in brush. Uh, I was kneeling down and couldn't hold my bow vertical. When you shoot instinctively, none of this is a problem. Once a person has learned how to shoot instinctively and has learned how to practice properly, you can shoot a bow from literally any position you can imagine. You can shoot a bow lying on your stomach, you can shoot a bow lying on your back, kneeling. Um, I'm sure you could shoot a bow while jumping straight up in the air. In fact, I've done this a couple of times when I stepped on rattlesnakes. <laughs> the real hunter, the person who wants to take any opportunity that nature and the animal presents, needs to be able to shoot in any situation regardless. And what I'm going to do now in this video is give you some demonstrations of instinctive shooting, things that have actually happened to me while hunting for specific animals. And I think once you see these, you'll understand the why of wanting to shoot instinctively with a bow in a hunting situation. Let's take a crack at some of these and you'll get some real good feel for what I'm talking about. Last summer, I was in Siberia. I was hunting Siberian snowsheep. I stalked in on a huge ram, a ram that I had seen and photographed several days earlier. I was within 30 yards of him in his bed, fully expecting to be about 10 yards when I finally raised up to shoot. The ram unexpectedly got up and began to feed. And I was lying on my left side with an arrow knocked and my bow in my right hand. Now consider I'm a right-handed shooter, so I should have been like this. But this is the way I was crawling on my side. There was no time to do anything, and I knew that if I raised up, the ram would see me. What I did was when the ram's eyes went behind a small rock that was between us, I rolled onto my right side, came around like this, Again, I could not raise up, he would have had me, and I merely came to full draw and put one right through the boiler works at 30 yards with my bow horizontal to the ground. That ram is the greatest trophy of my bow hunting career. I could not have done it had I been shooting sights. No way. Because had I gone up to hold my ver bow vertical, no matter how short the bow, the ram would have spotted me and bailed over the edge of the bank he was on. But by being able to keep the bow down, level with the ground, come back here, and snap shoot the minute my finger touched the corner of my mouth, which we'll talk about when we talk about form, the arrow was gone, right to the target. We're going to demonstrate several different shooting positions that could occur to the hunter. We're going to do them from three different angles so you can see what we're doing. And as bizarre as it may seem, my first position, shooting from my back, I know two different bow hunters who actually took animals while lying on their back. Watch. If I 
had to say for sure the most common, uncommon shooting position, I'd say it's kneeling. Uh, off the top of my head, I've probably taken 50 big game animals or more in a kneeling position. You're stalking, you're using cover, you're staying low to the ground, the opportunity presents itself, you're kneeling. You're not going to stand up and hold your bow up like this. And shooting kneeling is very easy, especially if you practice enough to work your muscles up. All you do is just come to full draw and shoot. Another position that I've found that I've used a couple of different times I can think of once to take a good black bear is shooting behind you. Uh, you're standing there or walking along, you hear a noise behind you, you turn and there's an animal and you know that you don't have time or can't afford the movement to turn. You can do it one of two ways depending on the position. You can either catch your bow and shoot under gear this way or has happened to me in a situation where I had brush in the way, you can do this. Shooting behind you is quite common in a tree stand. I've talked to dozens of guys who said, I knew the buck would come by in front of me. I had my shooting lanes figured out. He came by behind me. Well, in a tree stand, you can't turn behind you with a tree at your back and shoot this way. Your bow will hit it or your tree stand will get in the way. So you have to go like this. Most guys I've talked to with sights have never even made the shot. Now we're going to talk about how you shoot instinctively. I think the first and most important thing to learn about instinctive shooting is correct form. If I had to say one thing was critical to consistency in hunting while shooting instinctively, it's going to be your form. If you break form, your arrow could fly just about anywhere. Some years ago, I learned how to shoot instinctively from a man named John Schultz. John is the last living bowyer who was taught to hunt, shoot, and build bows by Howard Hill. John is one of the most incredible shots with a longbow I've ever seen. I've actually seen him shoot an aspirin out of the air. Anyway, the first thing John taught me was the correct draw procedure. And again, this is the way he learned it. Everyone has little variations. But John taught me the swing draw technique, which Howard Hill used in hunting. Very similar to a good wing shot, swinging up his shotgun, moving with the bird and shooting. Proper stance is important for shooting. Body 90 degrees to your intended target. Your feet should be out about as wide as your shoulders. And I always have a little bit of looseness in my knees, a little bit of bend. Fred Asbell wrote an excellent book on instinctive shooting, and he talks about bending his knees rather significantly but Fred is six foot six inches tall and I think he has to get down where he can see under the tree branches at my height if I bend my knees too much I'm down below the level of the grass I recommend a more comfortable position I think and that is bending slightly at the waist but you get your feet angled properly get nice and loose and relaxed get 90 degrees to your target and you're in a comfortable position. Same position you'd use wing shooting with a shotgun. You begin the swing draw by being in the ready position. You push with your bow hand while pulling with your string hand. And you begin drawing the bow up. Your eye is glued to your target. It never leaves it. That's critical. We'll talk more about that later. So you push, pull, and when you get on a level with the target, you should be back to within eight inches of full draw. And then you hold your bow hand steady and complete your draw, like this. Again, push-pull, come up to level, and finish the draw. If you bend forward slightly at the waist, and put this shoulder a little towards your target, you're in a very comfortable position. Again, just about the same position you'd use with a double barrel shotgun. Then when you draw, bend your head down. It gets your eye close to the line of the shaft. The shaft is close to your hand. 
your eye is down on the shaft. Same thing as shooting a shotgun at a flying bird. So this would be about correct form. The canting of the bow is really quite unimportant whether you have it this way or this way. Although at very close shots I tend to cant my bow rather drastically, which gets me down closer. And at longer shots I have a tendency to have my bow much more vertical. Okay, again, you swing, draw by pushing and pulling. You bend forward slightly at the waist. Your stance is loose. Your anchor point is very critical. Anchor point, very simply, is that place where your hand always comes every single time before you release the arrow. If you don't have an anchor point, if you have a floating anchor, you could shoot from anywhere. I always anchor with my middle finger in the corner of my mouth. Many people use their forefinger. The problem with that is it puts your arrow lower down on your face so your eye is looking down on the arrow instead of along it. Anchor with the middle finger in the corner of your mouth. If it helps, take your thumb and lock it under this jaw. But it's real important always to come to the same spot every time before you release the arrow. In so doing, you always draw your arrow the same length that means that your bow is shooting the same poundage at that draw length, the arrow is traveling at the same speed each time, so it's always going to go on the same flight path. I'll give you a classic example of what happens if you don't train yourself to come to the same anchor point every time. Barry Wenzel made a great movie called October Whitetails. And in it, Rick Blaws, one of his hunting buddies, was in a tree stand, and a whitetail buck was coming from his right across to his left. The camera was above and behind him. The deer was stopped right in front of him, probably 10, 12, 14 yards. And Rick shot and shot about this far to the left or in front of the deer. And turns to the camera with his look of surprise on his face as in what, it, what, you know, what went wrong. It was real interesting to run that footage back and instead of watching the deer in the air, watch Rick's release. Because what he did in his excitement, when he came to full draw, instead of anchoring on the side of his face, like this, in excitement, he released about four inches off of the side of his face. Well, that's off to the right. That means the arrow is going to the left. And at 12 yards, that 4 inches here would deviate the flight path of the arrow probably 18 to 20 inches. Come to the same anchor point every time. Do it over and over and over again, concentrated on it when you're practicing. Then in the pinch, you should be able to do it each time. Again, to the corner of your mouth, seat in, and then release. Once you've learned an anchor point, once you're starting to train yourself to use the same anchor point over and over again, then your release is probably the next most critical thing. I do not have a good release. I don't have good form. I've been working on it for 10 years and it'll be another 10 before I get it perfect. But in theory, a perfect release is when all you do is uncurl these fingers and release the bowstring. Your hand should never move away from the face. When your hand moves away in varying degrees, either like this or even as much as this, it's called a pluck. I've been working on correcting a pluck for a long time. Uh, at one point, John Schultz even held a sharp broadhead right away from my hand so that if I pluck, I got stabbed. That helped a bit. There are several ways to work on a pluck and concentrate on it, but the big thing is to try to remember each time, come to anchor and then only uncurl your fingertips. I'm not the one to demonstrate it, but I'll try to give you an idea of what a perfect release is. I've seen plucks in various degrees, including a one bow hunting friend that plucks like this when he shoots. Here's an intentional pluck to show you what bad form is. 
Many times a bow hunter will pluck because his bow is a little too heavy and he's trying to get that last little bench bit of, of draw length back so he'll go like this to get a little more rope from the string. But let's watch what may be a good release. Keep the hand tight to the face and only uncurl the fingertips. Another common bad habit is to drop the bow arm upon release, like this. I don't really know why people tend to do that. It may be part of, of a pluck that's intended to draw more. You tend to go like this, trying to get more out of the arrow. But it's very important when you release an arrow to try and hold that arm steady. I shoot fairly heavy bows, and most bows will give you some hand shock, and that's where you get a kick. And I'm going to try really hard to not only make a good release, but to make sure that my bow hand moves hardly at all. That little bit of movement you saw was strictly the kick of the bow. This bow is 70 pounds at my draw length. Let's do it again. Try to work on the release, but let's really concentrate on the bow hand and keep it as steady as possible. One more time. If the bow hand drops, and typically it drops down and to the left, if you're a right-handed shooter, your arrow will go down to the left. Good clean release, keep your hand into your face, and keep that bow hand right there. A compound bow with sights is drawn differently than a traditional bow shooting instinctively. For one thing, you have nowhere near the weight at full draw. But the other thing is, when you're shooting with sights, most fellows ankle, anchor under their chin. They have a, a string down the center of their nose. And they will have a fairly long draw because this elbow is generally locked in towards the bowstring. And they're in this position. It's a very uncomfortable, unnatural position. And generally, it takes a bow hunter several seconds to launch target. Shooting instinctively, shooter generally loses about two inches of draw length shifting from compound with sights to a traditional bow without sights simply because you lean into your shot i bend my elbow out away from the bow string i don't even have to wear an arm guard and i'm relaxed it's a very comfortable very very comfortable way to shoot watch typical compound draw typical instinctive draw. I went from 28 inches with my compound and sights to 26 inches with a long bow or with a recurve. It's not a big deal because my bows are weighed at my draw length. Nice relaxed attitude, elbow bent away, everything comfortable. It's extremely important to learn your form before you even begin to worry about hitting anything. A uh, common mistake is to try and hit something, try and pick a spot, try and shoot a twig or something without having your form down right. What I suggest is exactly what John Scholes taught me. Get yourself about six or seven yards for some hay bales. Do not pick a spot on those bales and shoot over and over again for form. Don't shoot after you're tired. As soon as you start to tire, quit for the day or quit for that morning and wait till evening because when you tire is when you get sloppy. Take a look. I was not shooting at any spot. I was using form techniques. And even then, the arrows are grouped close together. When a person starts to aim, that group will tighten up very considerably. Lots of people ask, how do you aim? Uh, it seems this is the mystery, the, the thing that they think is some sort of black magic. Aiming is probably the easiest thing of all about instinctive shooting. I consider getting good form the toughest thing, especially if you already have bad habits, which I did when I started shooting instinctively the proper way. Aiming is easy. Aiming is two things, hand-eye coordination and memory. Hand-eye coordination basically is 
something that's built into all of us. It's instinctive. The basketball player who throws a ball through a hoop, the baseball pitcher who pitches a ball perfectly where the catcher wants him to, uh, or you crumpling up a lot of paper and throwing it in a wastebasket 10 feet away. Most people are right-handed. In fact, my wife says everybody's born right-handed and only a few overcome the handicap. Personally, I think she's wrong. Usually, if you're right-handed, your right eye is your dominant eye. It's critical to make sure that your right eye is dominant if you're right-handed. If it isn't, you're going to have to change something in your shooting. How do you tell? Very simple. What you do is with both eyes open, you point at something, let's say on a wall opposite you. And you'll notice that your finger is definitely pointed at that item. You're right-handed, use your right arm, close your left eye. If your finger stays pointed at the item on the wall, that means your dominant eye is your right eye. Now close your right eye, hard for me to do, and if your dominant right eye, you'll notice that your finger jumps over to this way. I'm going to turn around, we're going to demonstrate this from behind with a camera. It's a little difficult because of the fact that the camera has one eye instead of two. But let's take a look at it. What you do is point at an object, that tree, close your left eye, and if your finger stays pointed at it, then your right eye is your dominant eye. If your finger seems to jump over, that means your left eye is dominant. Okay, now let's point at it again, close the right eye. My finger has now jumped over several feet. Do that test to make sure which eye is your dominant eye. If you're left-handed, and your left eye is dominant, everything's fine. If you're right-handed, your right eye is dominant, everything's fine. If you're right-handed and your left eye is dominant, you're probably going to have to learn to shoot left-handed. It's very, very difficult to shoot right-handed with a left dominant eye. Okay, let's take a look at a couple of other exercises here. Let's talk about aiming, learning how to aim. It's very, very simple. In fact, you can do this right in your living room while you're watching this film. What you do, assuming that you're right-handed and you know your right eye is dominant, look at a picture or a light switch or something across the room and simply look at it and bring your arm up in line underneath your chin with your eyes over your arm and point at it. Every time you do that, you will be pointing at that object. It's guaranteed. It's all part of what's inside here. That's the way trick shooters shoot pistols. That's the way skeet shooters shoot a shotgun. They don't aim. They don't use a bead. They don't use sights. They look and point. Look and point. We're going to try and demonstrate this by looking over my shoulder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up on the vitals on the deer and then I'm going to try to move my head and keep my arm in line. And it should, in theory, be pointed right at. Let's take a look. Hard to demonstrate on film, but you'll notice that you've got a direct line down my arm, my fingers pointing right at the vitals. It would be even more, more uh, interesting to look at if the camera lens were actually two lenses like your eyes. So look and point. Look and point. All right, you know how to aim with your finger. Practice that. In fact, I make it a habit of sitting around my living room if I'm watching a TV show or something like that and every once in a while I'll just point at something. Now, how do you do it with a bow and an arrow? It's very simple and this is some of what we taught you about form earlier. All you do is make a line between your eye, your hand, and your hand out here. And you're looking at something doesn't matter what it is, but you're looking at it, and in your peripheral view, you will see the arrow. And actually, because you have two eyes and both are open, you'll see the illusion of two arrow shafts converging towards the point of the arrow. You never look at the arrow intentionally, but you keep it in your peripheral view, and you will see that it's lined up. And what you do is you pick an object, then you pick a spot on the object, and all you do is look at that spot, stare at it, concentrate on it, 
Get your head down close to the shaft. The shaft is close to your eye. You'll notice this bow does not have a rest on it. I'm shooting off the shelf. The arrow is almost touching my finger. So the arrow and my hand come together as one. The hand and the arrow are my pointing devices. If I had this bow drawn and released this arrow, I would center the lens on the camera and have a very angry cameraman. All right, let's try it a little bit and see what we're doing. The most critical thing of all, once you're ready to start aiming, is to remember that you don't aim with the tip of your arrow, you don't aim with a sight pin, you aim with your mind and your eye. Mind and eye. For example, when a deer walks by me, I look, if I know I want that deer, I look at a spot on that animal's rib cage, and that is the only thing upon which I concentrate from then on. I don't think about yardage, I don't think about the tip of my arrow being lined up with something. I look at that rib cage. I stare at it. When the animal's in correct position, I am staring and concentrating so hard I'm shaking. I draw, look at that spot, and release. The rest of it is all natural. It's all in your head. I'm looking at a spot on the rib cage of the deer. Now, I'm exaggerating this. I'm just going to concentrate on it just going to concentrate on it. I come up, utilize my correct form, and release. The arrow went exactly where I was looking. It's all natural. And what I suggest in practicing this is do it at close range only for a while. Look at a spot on your target and stare at it, concentrate on it, and shoot. And just a few shots, you'll come in. Let's take a couple of, uh, let's look at a couple of other things here, and we'll show you some good practice techniques. One other important point in the technique of aiming that I'd like to demonstrate, and again, some of this is hard to do with a one-eyed camera, but in a standard, say, sight shooting stance, your head is a great deal higher than the arrow, and so you're looking sort of down at the tip of the arrow at full draw with your target out there. By bending forward slightly at the waist and by bending your head or canting your head and canting your bow, you get your eye right down along the arrow shaft. You create that line again. Always remember that and make sure that you kind of get into it. Same as looking down a double barrel shotgun. Okay, first we shoot for form. Recommend six, seven yards into some hay bales, let us say. Don't aim. Now we're going to start shooting at something. And what I'd suggest, instead of going to a 3D target that looks like an actual deer, let's take a bale of hay, and instead of shooting at the entire bale, let us create a spot, a spot at which to aim. Don't be concerned if you don't hit the spot. That's really unimportant right now. What it is, is something for you to concentrate on and try to drill a hole with your eye. That's what John Schultz taught me. Drill a hole with your eye, then with your arrow. Drill a hole with your eye. Look at the spot. Just stand here and look at it. Now as I draw and shoot, and I'm going to hold my draw no longer than I normally do. I'm a snap shooter. When I'm shooting at game, the finger hits, the arrow's gone. But for illustration purposes, I stare at the piece of paper. I don't care if I hit it, but it's a reference point. I stare at it. Let's try it again. Stare, release. That was way off because I was trying to talk when I shot. We'll keep quiet this time. Stare, release. Stare, release. Dead centered it. Look, point, release. Look, point, look, point. That's all instinctive shooting is. I'm close to my target to get my eye down on the shaft, 
I can't my bow rather severely. If the target were 40 yards away, I would probably have my bow up at an angle something like this. Because at that distance, I have the bow raised, my eye is close to the shaft anyway. The closer I am, the more I can't my bow. Once I've used the white paper or some spot on the hay bale, and I've gotten to the point where I'm looking at that spot and shooting, then I graduate. I use what's called an Ames target. What it is is an animal silhouette on hay bales, and it has the vital area encircled. So now I don't have a little spot, I've got a big spot. But you want a little spot. You don't ever shoot, for example, at an elk or a deer at the lung area. You pick a hair in the lung area and try and split it. So what I'll do is I'll look at my silhouette of the deer, the main circle covering the vitals, and I will pick a spot, even if it's imaginary in my head, within the circle, stare at it, draw, release. Watch it from behind me now. Once I've gotten through shooting at, a, at the burlap, at the aimed burlap target, and learned to concentrate on a spot within the circle, the circle being a sort of a teaching aid, then what I do is I graduate to a real deer-sized 3D styrofoam target, like that one. There is no circle drawn on the kill zone. I have to pick a spot. I have to look at the elbow of the deer and then pick a spot slightly behind it. That wasn't a good shot. Broke my concentration. Concentrate, concentrate. The circle not being there makes it a little more difficult. All right, this time we'll really stare and concentrate. Bingo. Let's do it again. Stare and concentrate. Make your own circle and then make that little dot right inside your brain. Bingo, right in the boiler works. Your mind is what does the aiming. You've got to create the spot. Once I've shot the 3D target, then I begin to go out in the woods. And I'll place the 3D target in some brush, very real just like there was a deer there. I'll also do a lot of stump shooting and I'll use some different techniques to learn about range. Let's explain memory as part of the instinctive shooting process and arrow trajectory. The memory function is really simple. It's remembering or memorizing the flight of an arrow. I never ever think of yardage as in 32 yards, 49 yards, 4 yards. I don't do it when I'm hunting. I just look at an animal and I know its size. I know its size and I know the size of the things around it. A hump of grass, a fallen tree, a tree trunk, a branch. All these things are here. So I never think deer, 30 yards. What I do is I think deer, lungs. The way you learn the trajectory trajectory of your arrow is by shooting at varied ranges. It is extremely rare when I shoot an animal over 20 yards. I don't do that for two reasons. One, to me, bow hunting is primarily the challenge of getting close to an animal, really close. If I wanted to shoot an animal at 80 yards, I'd use a 7mm magnum. The other thing is I don't feel comfortable with it. These animals mean a great deal to me and I just don't want to take a chance at wounding. Occasionally I do shoot at longer ranges than an animal. Uh, killed my sheep, which I mentioned earlier, at 30 yards, but it felt good. I knew it was right. And I practice constantly from virtually zero yardage to about 90 yards. I would never, ever take a shot at an animal at 90 yards, but by shooting at 90 yards in the woods, what I do is I learn the flight of an arrow. Keep in mind, when I look at that deer silhouette, 
My eye is looking in a straight line right at the kill zone. My arrow, however, will not fly in a straight line at that range. Don't know how far it is, 40, 45 yards, but my arrow will arc trajectory. Even a rifle bullet arcs at 200 yards, you're going to shoot low unless you hold high to compensate. What you, the instinctive shooter, have to learn is the arc of your arrow. You learn that by shooting at varied ranges. And sure, at first, real easy shooting at six, seven yards like we have been, you're probably going to shoot low or you'll over anticipate the trajectory of the arrow and you may shoot high. But eventually, by knowing that that's an accurate size of a white-tailed deer, your brain will register the size of it. Your brain will register from memory, from shooting experience, the trajectory of the arrow, and you'll probably come pretty close to hitting where you want to. Again, I feel this is the excessive range to actually hunt. Let's see what happens. A little high. This time I'll concentrate a little more. And I won't really think about the trajectory. It should just come to you. It should be in your instinct. Over the top. Let's try it again. I'm not really concerned about left to right here. In fact, both shots have gone to the right. Mostly what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to think about distance versus size of the animal. We're getting in there. Again, I would never hunt at this range, but it's exceptionally good practice. Actually, I much prefer stump shooting when I'm shooting longer shots. On my last shot, I also noticed that I plucked, and that's probably why I'm shooting to the right. This time, what I'll try to do is concentrate on two things, my release and the range. Bingo. This is probably an excellent example of why you shouldn't be shooting at an animal at the kind of range that we, were, we just were. You begin to get spread out. It's harder to pick a spot. Uh, you have a tendency because your target gets smaller and smaller to think about that more than you do about good release and good form. To me, it's an excellent example of why we should be shooting at 20 yards on down. Each individual has a different comfort zone, what I call it, um, with bow instinctively shooting at animals. Uh, some of the really great bow hunters, uh, Paul Schaefer, Barry Wenzel, Fred Bear, probably have a longer distance comfort zone than I do. Um, for me, I like 20 yards, occasionally 25 or 30. And I guess my biggest challenge is let's get in close. Let's see if I'm a good enough weasel to do it. Let's try a couple more shots and just see what the arrow looks like at longer ranges. In addition to trying a few more shots at longer ranges, I guess maybe mostly to show you arrow flight, I'm also going to do something that I do all the time when I shoot. This is critical. Never shoot from the same position. Don't ever just stand there and shoot. Another thing I don't recommend is shooting a standard archery target with a bullseye across a green lawn. Get out there where the animals live, where you have things, bushes, plants, stumps. But I always change position, usually about every shot. Take a shot standing, Try and be in the position you think you might be in the woods if a bull elk steps out from behind cover. Try some odd ones, too. I mean, you could be sitting like this waiting for an elk you think is going to come there and he could be behind you. Not bad for an old man and a dwarf to boot. Now let's put a real challenge onto it. It's another thing I practice. I always practice hunting situations. That's key. I'm a hunter. 
I'm not a target shooter. I'm walking along in the woods. I hear a noise. A deer has jumped out of his bed behind me, and I just whirl and shoot right in the goodies. Pick up another arrow, walk a little further out, whirl and shoot right in the goodies. Another arrow. This time I'll drop down on one knee. Ah, I missed, but I had a good time. Let's analyze what we're doing here as we whirl and shoot. The ear picks up the sound of the whitetail jumping from his bed. The mind says something's there. Now what you got here is the fastest computer that ever has been and ever will be designed. So as you whirl and turn, you're in mid-stride, you hear the noise, you start your turn, your bow is in the ready position, but the first thing that happens is your eye sees the buck. And immediately, in a millionth of a second, the image is created. The eye sees the buck, the eye picks the spot, and everything else is natural. You're in motion, you drop down, you draw and release, but the whole time the eye is riveted to what you want to hit. We've got a tremendous instinctive ability. That's why it's called instinctive shooting and that's why it's far easier and far more efficient in hunting than sights. Let's talk a little bit about equipment for instinctive shooting. One point that I'd like to make is that you can shoot a compound bow instinctively. In my personal opinion, it's not as good for instinctive shooting as a recurve or longbow. The reason is quite simple. The push-pull style, the swing draw, and the way you shoot instinctively is all supposed to be very fluid. Picture a skeet shooter or a good shot uh, at birds on the wing. Everything is fluid. The clay pigeon or the bird goes out, the hunter just swings up, bang. Everything is fluid. When you draw a compound bow, everything is fluid until it breaks over. It would be just about the same thing if a wing shot were shooting at a rough grouse with a double barrel shotgun, swung on the moving bird, and his barrel hit a good sized tree branch, stops him. It's the end of the fluidity. Everything goes out of sync. In fact, trying to shoot aerial targets or running targets with a compound is, is difficult because of the breakover. Most of the fellows I know who have put away their sights and shot their compounds instinctively almost invariably end up with a traditional style bow. The beauty of these bows is you don't do anything to them. Other than setting a knock point and doing your brace height, making sure that your string is close enough or far away enough from the riser, that's it. Uh, by the way, we did a video called Setting Up Longbows and Recurves and Shooting Them Instinctively. And at the end of this video, we'll list sources for that. That delves much more into setting up bows, traditional bows, and a little bit about instinctive shooting. The bow that I've been using during most of the filming of this video is a a bamboo longbow, 70 pounds at my draw length of 26 inches. I've now got my quiver on it. I've been using, by the way, a Cordovan leather tab. Very simple, no divider. It's just a piece of leather, probably the slickest leather known to man. For many years, I used a traditional style, fairly heavy leather shooting glove. They're darn good. The thing I guess I don't like about them now that I've started shooting the tab, the leather is thick so it, your finger is a little further away from the corner of your mouth, but you miss the feel that you get with bare fingertips. And if somebody said to me, what's your opinion, I'd say, get yourself one of these Corvin tabs, treat it with pitch blend leather dressing, and you'll keep it slick and it'll last for years and years. One of the things that I found when I was shooting a compound with sights, I spent more time tuning the bow than I did shooting it. I'd get up in the morning to go hunting and I'd take my first shot with it and something would be wrong. Let me demonstrate an interesting point. I've been shooting with one particular bow all through the video. Basically I can pick up any bow. Here's a Screaming Eagle takedown longbow.
All I do is just pick the bow up and string it. I can then turn and shoot it. I don't have to worry about tuning it. I know the brace height is okay. This is a stout little booger. My problem with this bow, it's new. It's the fastest bow I've ever shot in my life. And I shoot high with it. And this is the bow I'll be hunting with in three weeks over in Russia. And this is the bow I'm actually doing most of my shooting with now. Pick it up and shoot. Here's the first long bow I ever got back in 1974. It's 18 years old. Shoots just like a dream. Knock an arrow, shoot. Now we go from a longbow to the tiny little 52 inch Texas recurve. Same weight, but a whole different bow. Draw and shoot. We go to a takedown recurve, 56 inches long. Same basic poundage at my draw length. Now here's a real test. This is the sinew back Plains Indian bow. I built it myself. It's backed with elk tendon. It's about 68 pounds at my draw length. Draw it and shoot. That was the best shot so far. Another sinew back bow. 85 pounds at 26 inches. And we'll give you some exercising ideas to keep your arms and, and back muscles in shape to shoot these. Little primitive bow, same as the Plains Indian used. Draw and shoot. The beauty of instinctive shooting is that you can pick up virtually any bow. Don't have to fiddle with it. You don't have to tune it. You don't have to worry about it. You put an arrow on the string and you shoot it. And whether it's a sinew back bow like that one, which probably would shoot through a Cape Buffalo, or whether it's a takedown long bow like this one, the story's the same. Arrow on the string, look at your spot, draw and shoot. Instinctive shooting is the simplest, most effective hunting technique there possibly is. You can't go wrong with it. It makes you a better hunter. It makes you get close to your game, it gets you in tune with your instincts and with the nature. And what we're going to do now is we're just going to go through the woods and I'm going to show you my best form of practice, which is stump shooting. Let's take a look. When I'm stump shooting, I use a judo head. I can shoot into trees. It just won't penetrate beyond the prongs. If I shoot into the grass, instead of burying itself, it flips up. And I'd recommend these highly. They really work well. What I do is just head off through the woods and I'll shoot at virtually anything. Stumps, trees, twigs, branches. Um, there up on the hill and amongst the rocks is some sort of an old piece of tin up there. Let's take a shot. Hit a branch instead. Basically, I just wander through the woods and having hunted many years, I have experience. I look for things that might actually happen. I'm on a deer trail. There's a stump. I don't even think of yardage. I can tell you now, looking at it, it's 25, 26. I draw and shoot. Perfect. Bad form. I felt myself pluck. Next time I'll concentrate on that. Now we'll try something really challenging. We'll do some aerial targets. This is a great way to sharpen up your instinctive shooting and your shooting at moving targets, running game, etc. Shooting aerial targets is a lot of fun and it's tremendous practice. I use what's called a flu flu arrow and I make these up with uncut feathers and leave them that way and they won't fly very far and they're real easy to see. We use specifically designed cardboard aerial discs and I use a fluorescent orange spot in the middle. That helps me a lot to pick a spot. I don't just shoot at the disc, I shoot at the spot in the middle of it. 
not only is this a real kick, I mean, it's a lot of fun, especially when you get several shooters together. But boy, it'll sharpen you up, especially for snap shooting, like you can't believe. Remember to be fluid and smooth. Don't have your bow partly drawn or up in position. Let the thrower throw the disc and go right from the swing draw up into your shot. Go! Don't expect to hit him every time. I don't know anybody except John Scholes that does. Go! 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 We've explained in this video why you should shoot instinctively. And I think we've done a good job of showing you how. We've taught you how to aim, shown you good form. It's a lot of fun. We've explained that and shown why. Now let's go out in the woods in a real hunting situation and show you why, how, and the rewards of instinctive shooting in a hunting situation. So long. Paul takes a stand in a natural funnel that pinches the moving deer into a narrow corridor of trees bordered by a beaver slough. Here comes one. Looks like he might be a good buck. He's a good buck. All right, come on. Take a spot. Come on. Oh, what a dandy. No, don't go over there. Come on. No, this way. Ah. Something's moving him. What's he watching? Oh, he's coming back. Got him. through the goody box. Man, what a dandy buck. He's already staggering. Oh, he's going down. He's going down. All right. Got him. What a dandy. Here's the arrow. I took him to look like right through the heart. 
the animal must have hit the off leg because it didn't get full penetration to go through. I actually saw the arrow flip out with the broadhead already broken off. The buck went right back through the funnel that he came out. If you set up You've got a warm slough over in there that doesn't freeze up so the deer can't come across there. They have to come around the slough through this little gulch and this thick stuff. And it's just always a good deer trail here. Yeah, I've hunted there quite a bit. Now yeah, he's dead. Oh, what a beauty. Oh man, what a buck. That's a good reward for 10 hard days of hunting. And a real nice buck, boy. Beautiful, symmetrical rack. Just an all-around good trophy. Not only that, but we got one more buck tag left and some more hunting season left. This is really neat. I think I died and went to heaven. <laughs> oh, what a beautiful animal.